And you're trying to give the young people something that will help them. And you don't know exactly what it ought to be. Welcome to the Teach Thought Podcast. Our mission is to rethink what's possible teaching and learning in a modern context. Join your classroom to the Teach Thought movement and be a part of the change. Thanks for joining us again on the Teach Thought Podcast. My name is Drew Perkins, the Director of Professional Development here. And if you're interested in Teach Thought Professional Development and bringing that same Teach Thought thinking to your school, please reach out to us and find us on the web at wegrowteachers.com. Today I spoke with Yong Zhao, who is an internationally recognized thought leader. He currently serves as the presidential chair and director of the Institute for Global and Online Education in the College of Education at the University of Oregon. He is also the author of several, several books, and we talked about a couple of those, his more recent ones today. Uh, One called Never Send a Human to Do a Machine's Job, Correcting the Top 5 Ed Tech Mistakes. And then the other one is Counting What Counts, Reframing Education. Education outcomes. We talked about changing the education paradigm from one of a deficit mindset to one that really focuses on the strengths and growth of students and talking about authentic products and inquiry and the future and purpose of schools uh, as well as his books. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the program, Yang Zhao, um, author of many, many books, but two recent ones. Um, I'd like to get you to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of them here, but let's start with the, the one that was out in November of last year, just a few months ago, called Counting What Counts. Tell us, uh, tell us about that, Counting What Counts, Reframing Education Outcomes. Uh, well, thanks, Drew. And, well, th- this book is really uh, uh, trying to capture, to say, you know, everybody talks about different education outcomes in you know, mm-hmm. trying to really say count what matters in education because, uh, as you know, education has been driven by standardized test scores sure. for a long time. We use that uh, to define everything and drive all the decisions, which I call very much of a deficit-driven education. That is, we, we try to ask what people do not have. And uh, in this book, I was trying to paint a broader picture to show, first of all, test scores, uh, are really a horrible measure of uh, capacities, and uh, they do not predict a person's uh, life success or even success in college, like, uh, for example, SAT SAT scores. Right. And they do not really even predict college success. So so what other things that matter? And uh, as you know, people have uh, pointed out to the 21st century skills, resilience, mm-hmm. creativity, and, but, you know, seldom that literature is brought together in one book. And uh, and because they come from different disciplines, so people talk uh, uh, differently. I said, well, if we brought them together, are there good measures? What do we know? And do they really matter? And how much they matter, you know, in, uh, reflecting with each other? So that's really a, a good literature review and synthesis of what we know so far, uh, what matters. And they may have different, you know, names for different attributes. But I think a, a more important message in this book is talk about uh, how difficult it is to require everybody to be the same. So a strong message in this book talks about, a lot about uh, schools perhaps should aim at uh, cultivating diversity. That was individual students would have uh, their own set of uh, abilities and capacity that make them successful individually rather than everything imposed upon for everybody yeah, uh, the standardization of of education obviously has um, has really hurt. I think that the progress. I was uh, I just started the the most recent book by Rick DeFore, and he actually address, mm-hmm. addresses that a little bit. Um, and so, when you think about uh, let let's go back to one of the questions that I I like to ask, and I think uh, I'm really curious to to hear your answer. Um, what's the purpose of school? What what why do we send kids to school? Well, I mean, in my mind, I actually think uh, uh, schools should be uh, there to provide opportunities to support the development of every individual potential. 
Mm-hmm. And instead of trying to fit into our existing workforce, even though that's what uh, we have been justifying schooling as, that is, we prepare you with the skills that uh, the uh, company may want, may, may want. But I think uh, if individuals are developed fully to their potential and given the right opportunities, uh, they will be able to find a job. If not find one, they can create one. So uh, I, I think a big challenge, even the 21st century skills, you know, talk about a lot about uh, uh, you know, the four C's, but uh, we're talking about four C's for everybody. And there's no differentiation. And But I think individuals are very different. Right. And 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 uh, as we think about that personalization and differentiation, which are, are clearly different things, sometimes misunderstood, but um, what what do you place, what would you place um, more as, as more important and why is in between thinking and content? Uh, we, we, we work a lot about that here at, uh, at Teach Thought Thinking and uh, thinking versus content. How do you, how do you see those puzzle pieces uh, fitting together? Well, I don't think they are necessarily that kind of contradicting each other. I think uh, uh, you need thinking. Thinking requires content to go with it. And content, in, unless it's uh, thought out and uh, is accompanied with certain other attributes, is uh, is useless. However, what I think the key is that we have common content or common thinking the same way for everybody or not. I think that's what uh, uh, the book uh, I'm trying to emphasize on to say, that's not necessarily the truth. You know, that is uh, what we have to do is that when people are pursuing certain things and uh, it's every task, every context is very specific and individualized. So even the content pursued by individual students should be different Mm -hmm. and differentiated from others. Right. Um, and so um, I, I don't think you're a fan of the, of the common core and, and, that, and that pursuit of sort of a common uh, set of content, although I think, the, I think common core is, is greatly misunderstood and misapplied. Um, I like the, the, some of the thinking skills behind it, um, and I think it's misunderstood as, as a driver of content. But um, when you think about your ideal school, if, if you're gonna, if you were gonna put together a school, start a school, what what are the pieces and parts that, or how would you how would you go about building that? Well, I mean, uh, my ideal school is that you would uh, uh, always start with the students you have. You create opportunities, and you are not there to serve. Uh, the uh, curriculum board or assessment board and you know, what what do you want to start with students to look at their strength look at their interest look at their passion to say how can i as an educator or how can i as a school leader uh, build a system and create enough opportunities to support you you know i've uh, always uh, uh, talked about uh, schools as uh, museums of learning opportunities children traverse through it and uh, and then they are well supported when they need uh, they, there's the opportunity. I think that even the Common Core, well, I think I, I, I understand your sentiment about the Common Core, you know, maybe misapplied. Mm-hmm. But even those uh, the common thinking skills, they are very individualized, they're very specific. So they can be very misleading in many ways. Whenever I hear anything common and core for everybody, <laughs> I think that's very a dangerous, uh, you know, kind of philosophy. So, what when you think about those different thinking skills, what what are some examples of those different thinking skills? Well, let's say you know, critical thinking or creativity. Uh, uh, they they are very differently applied for individuals who might be interested, let's say, in math, or or someone might be interested in music, others interested in language. And you can imagine the, the kind of creativity required for math thinking might be very different from the kind of creativity we need for music and because they are combined with content and the skills in those specific domains as well. Yeah. Um, so so you, you would say critical thinking would be a general uh, piece, but the way that it's applied would be differentiated um, based on their, uh, their interests and their aptitudes and that kind of thing? Yes, because, you know, there may be some generic thing called critical thinking, but uh, such critical thinking without supported with uh, uh, deep knowledge and a lot of experience with certain content, it would not be very valuable. But once you marry that with deep content, it's already a different uh, type of critical thinking than critical thinking in other domains. So so what's when you think about again that ideal school and what we're what we're really trying to accomplish what we really want out of our education system um what's getting in the way why why is it not happening because we've been admiring and and beating on this door and and pushing this rock up the hill for decades right 
Yeah, well, I think it's the mindset. The, the mindset that uh, uh, that includes, for example, uh, is a, a deficit mindset. That is, uh, first of all, we we think there's something that everybody should acquire. Then we apply that to individual to say what they don't have. And then we try to fix that. that. That's number one. I think, you know, people right now, it's very hard for them to understand that is, uh, you know, we're, uh, say we don't need a common curriculum. We don't need uh, a, a common classroom for everybody. I think uh, this that that part is very hard to understand. That often gets in a way and uh, to try to personalize education for individual students. Hmm. So, um so, so then thinking about um, that deficit mindset, how do how do we overcome that? What's the what's the because it's not it's not the opposite of growth mindset, is it? Oh uh, no no no, it's it's not growth. That's not that's called fixed mindset. That's not the, the right. same. It's uh, it is uh, 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 it is much more macro. That that is we. I think you remember you know, the old paradigm derives from the industrial age, which is talk about, you know, we are preparing students for existing jobs and existing jobs or existing society has certain requirements for you to participate. And then from that, we derive this set of curriculum or whatever we call it, knowledge, skills or content. And we expect everybody to achieve, to have that. And so we, we you know, everybody entering school in the old model is presumed to be deficient. Mm. And our job is to fix that so that they meet the standards that uh, are artificially derived or maybe some people call it empirically derived. Mm -hmm. But that may not be the case. So what we need to change is to going back to say uh, children, first of all, are able to learn. And children are do come to school with different weaknesses and strengths, and children do have different uh, uh, interests and passions. And uh, today, you know, we can see we arrived at a time that is uh, a lot of the traditional jobs and are gone, and the homogeneous type of jobs that, that are gone. You know, we used to prepare children to to master skills that can be replaced by machines. And now this uh, new society creates opportunities for all kind of talent, abilities, and passion to to become valuable, whether it's socially or financially or economically. And so now we need to go back to follow the children to support them, rather than trying to, you know, uh, trying to impose upon them something that we believe is common. And so we go with the strength model to say, okay. Yes, you are interested in this, and uh, you can learn. I'm here to support you, to guide you, but I'm not here to sculpt you. So when you think about that, um, obviously that's sort of um, antithetical to test scores and that kind of measurement, that typical accountability. But if that's a school model uh, that we're really in pursuit of, how do we know that it's being successful? How would you know that, that that's, that is a success, that teacher, that school, that setting, that student is being successful? Well, you know, each, every individual student, if they uh, pursue any domain, any passion or any of their strength, uh, there will be growth. So all the assessment, as uh, I suggest in the book, Counting What It Counts, uh, should be really uh, in collaboration with the students, should look at long term, should be very authentic. So you would always look at students, you know, have you helped an individual student grow during this uh, term, during this year? And the growth would show up in authentic products and also how they conduct something. For example, if uh, if a student interested in, in public speaking, you know, mm -hmm. let's say you, you probably can really figure out uh, over a year to see if there's growth. Uh, or students interested in math, you can see that math kind of product coming out would definitely be should be qualitatively different uh, no, from uh, the first day of the year to the last day of the year. Right. So it, when I think about, and, and I do um, and have done a lot of uh, project-based learning work with teachers around the country, and one of the things that I push on is authenticity. But I think that's a really hard thing to, to, to sort of get. You mentioned that authentic product. How do you define authentic, and how do you find that out? Well, f authenticity for me, it is, uh, uh, I define as uh, that is uh, you create something, whatever that thing is, could be a service, could be a, a product, could be a program, could be action, and but that has to serve a genuine purpose. A genuine purpose could be meaningful to someone or valuable to someone. Uh, it could be solving 
a problem is so could be a, of intellectual you know, desire, you know, like poetry counts, uh, composition, music counts, and a uh, uh, painting counts, you know, or or a, a video game actually counts as a product. Sure. Yeah. And so you're you're mentioning some of the things that I really hit on. I was actually on Twitter last night um, in a in a chat participating, and somebody was talking about authentic audience, and and they said they were having a hard time finding authentic audience, and and I think it has to be connected to that purpose that you mentioned. So you know, what is the the audience doing with it? Are they is it just you know being sent to somebody, or are they actually sort of ideally looking for it or going to use it? Um, and to me, that really gets at that authenticity and so being clear about that product and purpose and audience um, is really really key uh, to me if the students don't know it and the teachers don't know it then it's really hard to to kind of get at some of the things I think you're talking about mm, well I think uh, students can be mobilized uh, to uh, action students should be accountable for finding uh, problems worth solving audiences uh, are worth serving mm-hmm. yeah. and that's part of the new new idea it's not only about uh, you know we learn all this stuff but learning is uh, for a purpose that's why you know sometimes i'm not very happy with uh, uh, some of the maker space movement looks like them producing something authentic but that authenticity is very much defined by the teacher mm-hmm. and uh, the project the, the products is defined by the teacher and by the students but i think it's important to uh, help students learn to understand, uh, uh, you know, action to identify their own audience, their own, uh, we keep pushing for them. That's one of the, uh, I think, new things in the future need to happen. That students, yeah, you can ask students, you're great, you put in that effort, you're learning something, but you should, we should ask students, you know, for what purpose? Who cares about what you're learning? You, you need to learn how to identify that. Yeah, and, and that's really to me. You're you're sort of hitting on, I think, one of the big friction points when we when I work with teachers to try to come up with really great projects, great work for students, authentic experiences. That that one of the great friction points I think think is in, in conflicts is that content that's driving everything. So they're trying to fit those things into and and driving all of the work that they're doing um, through that lens of well, we have to have them learn this content, and and it's understandable because that's the system and. In which they're working, but mm-hmm. um, what happens when that goes away? You know, sort of that genius hour or after school activities when there, or you know, some sort of elective where there is no content per se, and then you have students you have the ability to have students uh, help students identify problems and an audience and purpose that is not guided and not necessarily having to fit in that content box but it's but it's still a difficult process I mean I, I think it is really hard um, K through 12 and I don't know if you make any differentiation for younger to middle to older and all of that but how do teachers any any sort of advice and how teachers figure help help students figure out what it is that they want to work on those passions and, and that kind of thing well i think you know uh, first of all i mean i think Drew, you're absolutely right this is it is very difficult and, uh, and i'm calling this a paradigm shift you know mm-hmm. we are trying to when you've been driving and riding horse wagons for a long time uh, it's very hard for you to imagine how can a car uh, how can something move without horses you know <laughs> it's uh, uh, the, 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 that's you know just uh, uh it's we gotta re- have to actually rethink you know we and that's why this uh, this shift has really come from uh, uh, abandoning the concept of uh, prescribed content. Of course, right now, as we are working within the existing system, you ha- you do have horses, you do have horse wagons, and the so teachers have to somehow to to invent. And now we are putting a little dent on the system. But I think to make it sh- make it truly happen, we have to be brave enough to say you know forget about it. And uh, and actually. Ironically, if students are pursuing uh, authentic pro- projects, to give long enough time, not maybe a week, but maybe a year, maybe two or three years, uh, eventually they, they will cover the basic content that's prescribed. You know, you, they can't escape because uh, if those content knowledge uh, are so fundamental, uh, when students are, enga- are engaged in authentic uh, product making, and they will not be able to avoid that if that's uh, in so crucial. And another thing, of course, for teachers, I think right now within the existing system, uh, I would like to see, you know, at least uh, uh, start with the interesting project, ask students. 
and then gradually and then you will feed content later to 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 do that if you have to do it you know and of course you know we typically do this you know if uh, maybe like you call the genius hour or whatever we call it, you know the 80 20 rule if right, you start right. uh, changing 20 percent of it it's uh, uh, but but i think overall we uh, as teachers, uh, my suggestion is that uh, trust your students as amazing things can happen if you ask students to begin to brainstorm and begin to go through the process. And so we don't need to control the whole entire process. That's another thing I think uh, a lot of times teachers have been made or forced uh, not to give space to students. Yeah, it, it is it is a big paradigm shift. And one of the things that – and I really do appreciate uh, the movement – in the uh, what seems to be a big movement in in uh, in the teacher space to to in, in schools to sort of design and and do their professional development from inside and ed camps and all of those things and I think those things have real value but one of the things I think is important to note notice uh, or to to note is that um, that paradigm shift. Um, is a really big piece and it's not something that necessarily happens in a day or in in a short period of time and i think so i think there's some real value to to looking at a long-term approach and really using inquiry to get at those pieces uh to help people students included make that paradigm shift because it doesn't happen quickly it certainly hasn't ever happened quickly we've been working on it for decades right but um Mm -hmm. interesting um i I think the inquiry piece you've talked about making and creating and and students making things um and that inquiry piece is the other big piece that i think is really important and and so it it is really difficult no doubt to to get students to because you you say what what is it you're interested in working on and you know their first blush and their first their first pass at it generally doesn't yield really super powerful results because they're, they're first of all they're not used to it but mm-hmm. um, you know so really getting deep and using things like the question formulation t- technique from the right question institute or things like that to really get them to generate what do you really love what do you hate what do you really dislike you know passion things instead of well, I like video games and oh, mm-hmm. I'll you know do something on that so um, so to you know, to me that that inquiry piece is what I think drives or can drive and, and get get student passions and, and interests out in the in the open for real pursuit uh, for authentic projects. So, well, definitely, I think you know we, we gotta go back to Socrates. I think I kept asking student questions. We need to learn how to ask questions, and uh, right. I don't think many teachers have been given the opportunity uh, to do that because we have been trained. You look at teacher education. We teach teachers how to teach, how to tell, give answers rather than asking questions. Right. We need to change that in asking questions, keep probing, and mm-hmm. give suggestions. Is that I think, uh, but that of course requires a lot more one-on-one time instead of trying to you know lecture to a whole group. And so that that will you know, uh, the conditions have to change as well. Right. Well, let's shift gears a little bit here and talk about the other more recent book, uh, which is more uh, focused on something a little bit um, more micro about ed tech. So the, the book is called Never Send a Human to Do a Machine's Job, Correcting the Top Five Ed Tech Mistakes. Um, why? So why did you write this book? Because this is, like I said, a little bit more focused and uh, technology is, is a, a, a smaller piece of the puzzle for sure. Well, it's, it's kind of related, and also I have been uh, working with EdTech for a long time, and uh, so uh, I was trying to pull something together with uh, uh, some of my co-authors uh-huh. on this issue, is that uh, I think it really started with the big question that why hasn't technology uh, delivered the promised transformation, which has said, if you look at technology, we have invested a lot, we have done a lot, it's disrupted a lot of teachers' lives, we forced... You know, in the beginning, we said technology is not powerful, not enough access. Then we said teachers are not well prepared. I mean, we got teachers, uh, we probably tortured a lot of teachers, uh, gave them technology PDs and required <laughs> them to have technology, you know, companies for uh, licensure, certification, all those things. But really, by and large, even use the traditional old measure, uh, you know, the achievement gap has narrowed. Standardized test scores have, have not really, you know, uh, jumped up. You know, we still have the same issues over the like, many decades. And uh, so I was just wondering, uh, what, what's going on? I mean, there's a lot of debate in this field. We've done everything, I think. And uh, and also was, uh, you know, asking about uh, is all this uh, investment in the uh, Good and now with the new ESSA and with the 
People are talking about uh, technology-driven, personalized learning systems, learning analytics, big data. Uh-huh. And uh, people are getting excited about those things. I said, well, probably not. And hold it <laughs> a little bit. So, so I went back to say, well, what happened? What's going on? I mean, the basic answer is this, is that uh, uh, technology is powerful. Technology can do a lot of things, but it requires more of an education paradigm shift. Unless we change our educational thinking, and technology is unlikely to be to be very useful to be very, to realize its power. So that that's really uh, what I talk about. I mean, the title really uh, uh, is taken from uh, the movie The Matrix, and uh, the the idea is that uh, one of the things that we need to shift about is redefining the relationship between machines and, and teachers. And I think this technology allows uh, uh, teachers to become more human. You know, we should give a lot of mechanical tasks to uh, uh, technology, to computers, so teachers can become more Socrat- uh, um, become like Socrates, uh, talking, guiding students, and we become more human. We do the, the creative, the social type of job rather than do the mechanical things that computers can do. That's interesting. I just uh, I just have a I just did a podcast recording with uh, Jamie Bro- Brooker, the uh, one of the co-founders and uh, chief creative officers at Kahoot, and I thought it was really interesting his his um, his uh, take on it or one of their approaches uh, is kind of building upon what you're saying. There is is they look at themselves more of a tech as more than a tech tool or just a, a formative assessment quiz thing, but it's mm-hmm. really driving social learning and and they they talk about sort of a campfire bonfire approach. So using that technology to uh, to bring people, students, and, and and your community together that that classroom community together in a way that they can learn socially and and you you know, you can do all kinds of other things, like you said, sort of that questioning. So mm-hmm. very interesting. So what do you think of the new uh, ESSA? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's well, first of all, I really don't believe any federal policies uh, can truly improve education. I think they are messed, messed up, you know, as much as we, we got. And what, what can change our teachers, you know, I think, you uh, you know, teachers and the whole uh, the whole education profession, we got to become much more professionalized. So we do not really uh, do uh, kind of do a lot in response to such grand policies. And those policies, you know, they should be creating opportunities for students and uh, change differently, but not really overly regulating what we do as as educators. So so that said, you know, I'm uh, uh, pretty unhappy with uh, you know the. They're still having any uh, uh, testing. You know, there's still about uh, right. annual testing uh, from certain grades on. And, uh, but it is better than the child left behind. And uh, so the, and I, I worry a lot about this so-called personalized learning, which is really, uh, I think, a hijacking the term I use. I call personalized learning, meaning supporting students to personalize their own learning, not uh, kind of personalized by a computer, which is more disguised really of a scenario kind of uh, program learning, uh, which is uh, it's long gone, you know. So, so I think uh, when you reduce education to simple instruction or master of certain skills, that's probably a, a kind of detrimental to the long term uh, of thinking. You know, again, education is about developing human potentials. Human potentials including a lot more social, emotional, uh, a lot more than simply performing mechanical tasks. So, I mean, you're really looking at a, a, a big, big shift and, and, and pushing a big, big shift. Um, if I walked into a Yang Zhao created, you know, in, in your mind, the, the sort of ideal classroom, what, how is it different? I, I mean, it, or is it? Would it look terribly different? Um, or would it just sound different? Or um, well, what do you if think? I were to able to create one, I've seen actually in schools this. You probably will not see a classroom. You will see students working either in groups, in partnership with others on, on meaningful things, and teachers and technology uh, on the side as resources. Uh, you could you could see teachers and students and teachers confirm on issues. Teachers question them, ask them why it doesn't make sense, how it doesn't make sense. It's more like a perhaps a design studio, mm-hmm. a development studio type of things. It's that uh, you will see a lot of learning. You won't see much teaching. 
Yeah, it sounds a lot like uh, what uh, Terry Hike and I have talked about here at Teach Thought of, of developing mm-hmm. a school, sort of a learning lab, that kind of thing. Um, and and I don't know. I wonder if that if that threatens uh, some teachers now. Do they do they feel like that that's minimizing their role um, in in changing their 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 sort of power structure in a scary way? I hope not. I think it shouldn't because. Uh, as I said, it actually makes teachers more human. You do things that you do the best, you know, that is, uh, you know, interacting with people. We are human beings, you know, <laughs> so, right. and uh, there's no reason for us to repeat what uh, a podcast can do, what a video, you know, kind of uh, a recorded class can do, what a piece of software can do. Well, that's something we don't want to compete with anyway, you know. Yeah, it's interesting. I used to, you know, some people say, and I think this sort of applies to this situation or, or this, this, uh, maybe insecurities like teachers might think well to be to be the smart i need to be the smartest person in the room and i need to have all the answers which is clearly a false premise uh, and i used to think and i used to even say sometimes in workshops say well the smartest people in the room are the ones building capacity and the others but then i actually think it's a little bit different um and i've said this more recently is the smartest people in the room um, are probably the ones creating scenarios that allow the others to ask great questions to uh to do great things that kind of thing um, and that's yeah, more that's facilitation a, that's actually a very good definition i think uh uh, until today, we still think the smartest person is the person who holds the most knowledge. You know, that's remember that's before technology sure. time. You know, you know, you we, we think about uh, 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 Ho- and uh, with or the Homer traveled around because he could memorize all these big uh, songs or whatever he was memorizing. That's important. Like you know, maybe 50 years ago. You go to a bar, you play in trivia games. If right. you know everything, <laughs> you can carry that knowledge in your mind. Therefore, you are the smartest we consider. You know, those are for best memories. But now, you know, you can go to a trivia game bar if uh, just uh, open your phone and you can right. probably win the game, you know. Right. So 10 years from now or 20 years from now, what's education going to be look? What, what's it going to look like? What do you think? I have no idea because <laughs> it's such a, it, it's such a, it's a game of, uh, it really has to do. I don't think in the, an education is going to just happen. It, it depends on what we do. I mean, we get to redefine this. If uh, teachers, educators, parents, students are actively redefining it, it would be very different. Should be different because we have the need, we have the capacity, we have the potential, we have the resources. But if we stay here, do nothing, and I think the same paradigm will be per- per- perpetuated or continue. Yeah. Um... There's certainly lots of barriers, and I and I mentioned or you mentioned that professionalism, and I think that's a it's a big piece of teacher professionalism, and I think there's certainly a lot of passion, um, but it has been deprofessionalized in a lot of ways. One of the things that I really think is important to to and, and I think in this paradigm shift, it's a, it's an important piece is that that teachers are able to. Um, self uh, self critique and sort of you know critical friends process uh, their own work and when that happens and, and using a good lens using something that is a good qualitative lens that they're really uh, there's a common agreement of like okay so this is really what we're after um, then that sort of professionalizes the work and they're they're holding each other accountable for elevating their work and and I think that's a big piece of the of the paradigm shift and and I don't know how you know I think there's some some teacher movement there and, and I know I mentioned that word common, you probably bristled a little bit, but uh, when I'm thinking about the idea, like what is it we're really after and let's all uh, refine our work, um, not not necessarily looking at student outcomes per se, and that's that's a part of it, but is it, asking that question, is this, if we all agree that this is what we're after, then is the work that we're doing, uh, is my work really doing that in a, in a really great way? Oh, definitely. I think also important is I think I, I don't really like use the term teachers. I think I like to refer as educators. Uh-huh. Remember, we are because teachers really implies teaching, and I think educators is uh, it's a much much broader term. I think uh, I think uh, uh, we as a profession needs to rise above simple a mechanical delivery of information to students. We have right. to think about question what our profession is about and uh, and we're about in you know, the human beings about next generation of children and we need to become more, much more philosophical and much more uh, intellectual about our job and uh, and we, we perhaps to be have to be a little bit more idealistic too about in the, yes there are constraints but uh, we're supposed to be 
uh, working toward removing the constraints and not let the constraints, you know, kind of shackle us all the time. Right. Uh, so a couple more questions before we wrap up here. One, um, I'm curious your take, and I think this is becoming increasingly a more and more hot button issue in boiling point. I'm curious about your your sort of take on on the issue of charter schools. Is that uh, do you see that as as promising, as uh, detrimental, or what's your sort of feel on on charter schools? Well, I think uh, Drew, with any of those large kind of uh, very generic questions, it's very hard to uh, to answer because sure. like. Uh, as you know, charter schools are different from each other. Right. Uh, so, well, the public school, I mean, the charter schools, some are considered public schools, right. but, uh, you know, they are implemented different in different states, uh-huh. and they have different different regulations, and uh, and schools are different. So, I think, first of all, uh, uh, we need to know, research says, uh, charter schools have uh, different outcomes. We, we know that. We know there are plenty of uh, Written bad char- uh, charter schools out there who make a profit. Those are horrible things. We know there are charter schools that uh, do not require teacher credentialing. You know th- those things. So, so to me, I actually think you know what would be interesting if uh, charter schools were much better regulated and managed, and uh, if it does provide a viable uh, uh, option or of different kind of education. So it could breed new innovative schools like high tech high is a charter school sure. that, that did and uh, but it uh, but right now as we we do it in the traditional paradigm most charter schools are not doing that they're not about innovation and they are still trying to you know pride themselves by improving test scores right. of some students and depriving the opportunity of a lot of students especially in uh, most disadvantaged disadvantaged areas. So, so I think it's. Uh, I think the if charter school is about innovation, but actually, if that's the case, why can't public schools be you know more innovative anyway in a, in a traditional public system? Right, right. Yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, so one last question here. A lot of folks um, look to you as sort of a thought leader and, and thought changer, and, and sort of certainly a leader in the education field. And, and it's been great having you on. Um, as far as things that you've come across, um, other resources, people, um, things that you've seen, read, heard, what what sort of made you think differently or more profoundly, or something you say, boy, people should really check this out. Well, I think there's one thing everybody should check out is that there's a book come out of uh, Harvard uh, professor Todd Rose. It's called The End of Average. Uh, that's really very interesting to me. That is, there's no, uh, you know, average person, average brain. There's no average portfolio profile of success. I think it's uh, moving to the education and science of the individual rather than the the average, I think, is really, really interesting. And so that helps me you know, think a lot about it. The economists like Richard Florida talk about the rise of the creative class that helps. And then the Pink's work talk about the whole new brain. And we're losing you there. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. So you were talking about the rise of the creative class. Right, that's uh, Richard Freud. And, uh, you know, Daniel Pink's uh, Whole New Mind. That's an interesting book. And uh, and different changes. And uh, then I draw a lot of my, uh, my own thinking from uh, even the Asian education systems because, you know, I am Chinese. I, I came out of China. So, uh, and also travel a lot. I talk to a lot of educators, teachers, and students. And, uh, and uh, so, because in my position, I get a lot of people reaching out to me so i get heard, heard a lot of different stories yeah well thanks so much um i'll link to those um as i can in the uh in the show notes afterwards when we get on the website but uh young it's been great to talk with you and good luck with the with the books and um uh, hopefully that that uh the education that we education system we want to see in 10 or 20 years is actually going to come to fruition uh, we got lots of obstacles but um, if we keep pushing the rock up the hill maybe we'll we'll get it over the top right Hope so, Drew. Thank you. This is lovely talking to you. All right, great. Thanks so much. That'll do it for today. Thanks for listening. If you didn't hate it, please give us a quick review on iTunes. We record weekly and sometimes multiple episodes per week. Questions? Email us at podcast at teachthought.com or find us on the Teach Thought Twitter account at Teach Thought.